data science has been to the medical field, where machine learning algorithms can quickly process immense amounts of data, finding patterns that lead to the discovery of new drugs. Dr. Bisan al Lazakani has been at the forefront of this work, leading the computational biology and chemogenomics team at the Institute of Cancer Research, applying these techniques to cancer drug discovery. While tech companies carefully guard their private databases as their most valuable assets, Dr. al Lazakani has been instrumental in developing CANSAR, a free online database for cancer research including data from biology, chemistry, pharmacology, structural biology, cellular networks, and clinical annotations. Using this knowledge base, researchers all around the world and across multiple disciplines can use machine learning approaches to answer complex, multidisciplinary questions, making the discovery of new treatments more efficient and more effective. Dr. Al-Lazakani has played an integral part in shaping this incredible and exciting future of cancer drug discovery, and I am thrilled to welcome her to Gustavus and the Nobel Conference. Hello, and thank you very much for inviting me uh, to speak to you today. I've been very excited about this. Um, I'm going to tell you today um, sort of my experiences and views as a data scientist in oncology about the use of big data and AI in cancer research and try to address my thoughts about really the, the place and the future of AI in healthcare moving forward. Um, a little bit about myself before I, I start properly. So I was born in the Middle East. My father was a journalist and we traveled the world with him uh, when I was young, uh, settling eventually in London. Um, but I also uh, traveled a fair bit after that, including doing my postdoc in, in New York. In terms of my training, uh, my undergraduate degree was in molecular biology, um, but I really knew that I wanted to expand my understanding of the mechanisms of disease well beyond a few handful of examples and really learn patterns across all disease and all genomes. And for that, I knew that, that computer science, which was one, one other of, of my passions, was going to be key to it. So I also got a formal qualification, a, a master's degree in computer science from Imperial College, then combined the two uh, in Cambridge University during my PhD in computational biology, and then went to New York, where I expanded that even further um, through combination with molecular biophysics. And as I went through this journey, my interest in, in really the application of this interface between the molecular and atomic worlds together with the computational world to understand disease and to design drugs was increasing and especially increasing towards um, the areas of oncology. And in that, I worked both in academia and industry in order to translate some of my uh, research as close as possible to, to patient benefit. About 12 years ago, I joined the Institute of Cancer Research in my favorite city, London, and it was a true privilege uh, to join the Institute, um, not only because of its uh, long history, it's well over 100 years old, um, but because of its um, successes in the translation of scientific findings into patient benefit. As an example of that, um, the Institute, which is actually a college of the University of London, um, has a world-leading academic drug discovery centre um, that spans everything from basic biology through medicinal chemistry and everything you need for drug discovery all the way through to phase one clinical trials. And with this amazing setup, we've managed to discover um, in the past less than a, than a decade uh, sorry, less than a couple of decades, we've managed to discover 20 drugs uh, that were put in, in preclinical development, 10 in clinical trials, um, and abiraterone, uh, our prostate cancer drug, was discovered and developed at the Institute. So for a data scientist, this is an incredibly exciting environment to join in and, and be in. So cancer... I thought I'd start with a small introduction about the good news, the bad news, and some of the data in, in oncology. So the bad news is that about half of us are going to develop some cancer sometime in our lifetime. That's just reality. 
we are aging as a planet and the longer we live the more likely we are to get cancer at some point the great news is that for those patients that do get cancer about half of them we actually can cure them using existing treatments which is incredibly exciting and something that we as an international cancer community should be very very proud of but what it means is it leaves us the challenge of these other 50 percent that we're unable to cure um, to really understand why we can't cure them and really double up our efforts in order to find cures for them so what is it about these other 50 percent that we're unable to cure well, some of them actually have very complex cancers that we still, despite all our efforts, do not understand what is driving in them and what is causing them. And for others in this set, they may show initial response to our therapy, um, but like you see with the antibiotics, would develop drug resistance to the drugs that we are giving them. And it's really for these patients that I'm putting in a lot of my research and my effort in order to try understand and help empower the discovery of new therapeutics. The great news is that cancer is a great beneficiary of big data efforts worldwide. Just looking at some of the large genomic initiatives in the world, the largest are definitely in oncology. And we have between the different initiatives now sequenced the genomes of tens of thousands of cancer patients. And through these big consortium initiatives, we are making these anonymized data available to the research community to ensure that we benefit, um, benefit from all of them. Um, so, before I start telling you about my research, I thought we ought to start with some definitions. Um, firstly, what is big data? Obviously, big data is big, lots of it. Um, so, I put some just number crunching. If you take a whole genome of one cancer sample um, and, and store it all exactly as it is, that takes about one terabyte. So, that's what one sort of powerful laptop um, that would be occupied from, from a single sample, a whole genome sequence. Now imagine a nirvana where we're following the progression of the cancer as the patient goes through therapy and if the tumor uh, recurs after therapy, so maybe about 10 terabytes. And we've not yet thought about um, a whole bunch of other data like imaging data um, and other patient data that we might store. Through a sort of a back of the envelope calculation, we identified that, you know, for a single patient, if you really stored all of the data that we ought to be collecting, we're talking at least 50 terabytes of data um, for a single patient. And one of my favorite comparisons is that in comparison, the Hubble Space Telescope in the first 20 years of its operation only captured 45 terabytes of data. And that's just for one patient. So if we want to go to 100,000 patients or millions of patients, you could imagine how, when we're profiling our patients, how much data we are generating. But actually, I still think that lots of something is still relatively easy. It's a technical issue. So if you have lots of genomic sequencing, at least it's just genomic sequencing. But a key part of big data is just not that it's just a lot of it, but it's that they are very diverse. So when we are gathering the picture around uh, cancer patients, we have to think about genomes, proteomes, we have to think about MRI scans, uh, blood tests, pathology, and very importantly, cancer is a changing thing. And so it's not enough just to take a snapshot of a patient. We really have to be thinking about capturing all of these data over time. So big data are big and they are diverse. And very importantly, we have to be able to do something with them that allows a computer to be able to read and analyze them. The next definition I wanted to address with you is machine learning and artificial intelligence. The Oxford English Dictionary, I, I took this as a photo from, from our copy of the little Oxford uh, English Dictionary, 
Um, and it says that artificial intelligence is the theory and development of computer systems that are able, able to perform tasks normally requiring human intelligence. Hmm. So it seems like the computers have to actually be able to do the things that we require human intelligence for. Wikipedia is trying to be more expansive and says that historically it was really driven by the action, taking things from the environment and taking action somehow in order to achieve a specific goal. But more commonly, it is thought that when it is when computers seem to mimic cognitive functions that humans associate with the human mind or human intelligence, such as learning. So it seems like our definitions are slightly vague around it, but basically it's, it's when a computer at the very least behaves as if it's thinking like a human. So I wonder whether we've really achieved that. Let's see how far in that we've managed to get. So I thought maybe a quick short course in machine learning. So let's say we want to teach a machine how to identify, recognize, and predict winning athletes. And let's say we give our machine a fantastic training set, like Usain Bolt, and say, right, this is what a winning athlete looks like. Now I'm going to start showing you other pictures, and you tell me whether they're likely to be winning athletes or not. And if you're not careful, you might give it a picture that it hasn't seen before and it'll start comparing between the two and you never know it may say that all winning athletes do a funny strange pose and therefore this one is a winning athlete or maybe not so what is really important in machine learning because the computers simply are not intelligent enough to do it for themselves yet and I'll come back to that later is that an awful lot of the effort has to be in the training set. You have to train your computer algorithm. You have to give it lots of examples that are slightly different to each other and that give it the fullest picture possible of what it is that you're trying to predict. And ideally, you want to give it examples of what it is that it's trying to avoid to predict. And if you've done this job successfully, your computer algorithm will just learn to find what are the shared features between successful athletes. For example, um, you know, fitness, cardiovascular activity or, or other sort of positive associations that you might find with, with an athlete and would learn to ignore superfluous features like the way they're standing or the way they look or the way they point their fingers or whatever it is. So you see, so far, it's actually the algorithm isn't showing huge amount of intelligence in that it's just learning from the examples that you give it. But of course, this is becoming more and more sophisticated um, as we go. So now I'm going to indulge myself a little bit in telling you some of the work that we've been doing in using AI and this machine learning to discover new cancer drugs. So in theory, and this sometimes does happen infrequently, what you can do is take sequence, say genomic sequencing of, of cancer samples, compare them to normal tissue from the individuals, subtract one from the other, and identify a cancer driver. Once you've identified the cancer driver, it's going to be beautifully druggable. That's a word we use in, in my field, that you can design a drug for it. You design the drug, the drug works beautifully, you put it in patients, and it treats them, and everybody's really, really happy. And that was really, in a way, the promise of the Human Genome Project. Now, this has happened, and this, this sometimes does happen, just not very, very often. Most of the time, what we do is we do this. We take these genomic sequences, we apply this fantastic analysis to identify the strongest signals. And what you end up with is the soup of potential genes. And you look at this soup of potential genes, and most of them you've never heard of before. Most of them you have no clue how they work. Yet, the data are telling you they may be important in your hunt for a cancer drug. So the question is, how on earth do you then start going through this list of genes and identifying what you should work on?
you could go through it systematically, I suppose, but we all know that drug discovery is a fraught and very long and very intensive activity. Um, it can take anywhere between five to 10 years to get a drug from an idea to the clinic. Um, and at every step in the drug discovery pipeline, something can go wrong. You can have a hypothesis that you thought a gene was a driver and the hypothesis doesn't validate. You find that the hypothesis validates, but actually you can't develop any compound against it that you can move towards the clinic or you develop the compound and it falls over before it enters the clinic or even worse. And we see this a lot in oncology. You enter the clinic and it does not show the efficacy that you need. And what's worse, which I've talked to you about, is that you get it across the line, you have it approved and in patients and you develop drug resistance. Now, what I haven't really discussed in the previous slide is the cost. I mean, none of this is cheap, nor in time or effort, and definitely not in money. But of course, failing early is much better because you're investing less time, less effort, and less money. So if somehow you can figure out how to push the key decisions earlier on in this pipeline, then you might do a lot better in drug discovery. But this issue that I've told you about, this sort of, this big soup of potential genes and potential targets that we can go after, together with the fact that the cost of failures and, and how long it takes, has sort of really divided the community. While there's a lot of effort, both in industry and in academia, towards identifying novel targets, novel drugs, novel mechanisms to treat cancer, Many others are taking shelter in what we know. And there was a paper a few years ago called The March of the Lemmings in, can in Cancer Drug Targets that showed that, you know, vast efforts are still being uh, put in in the, um, in, the, in the drug discovery world for oncology on known um, systems, known targets, and just rediscovering or, or just improving on previous drugs. And that's because as a drug discoverer, you're constantly being torn between these two things. On the one hand, you want to innovate. You want to go into those areas of biology that we don't have answers for. On the other hand, you're afraid of failure. You don't want to spend five years trying to develop something that never even makes it into the clinic. So the question is, can we do something to manage this risk? So when I joined the ICR, I really joined it to address this question. Can we do something to manage the risk? And can we do something to take this soup of targets and prioritize it to make sure that what we are investing in has the highest chance of succeeding? We won't be able to predict perfectly, but can we at least load the odds in our favor? And then you think about it like any other investment decision. So when you want to make an investment, you want to do two things. You want to know as much as you possibly can about your investment. You want to identify what the risks are with your particular investment. And you want to make sure that you balance your investment portfolio. And that's really where AI and therapeutic discovery and development really comes in. When I joined the Institute, what we wanted to do was we wanted to make really objective decisions about these investments. We wanted to make sure that we're picking the best targets to work on, and more importantly, that we identify the risks so that we can do the right experiments early on. So if we fail, we fail in that earlier part of the, of the pipeline. In order to do this, we had to bring information from many different domains of knowledge that had previously not been linked with each other. Of course, we needed information from the clinic. We needed information from the multiomics, from the protein worlds and the systems biology world, from the chemistry world and the pharmacology world. But it wasn't enough just to put them in one place. They genuinely had to talk to each other and integrate with each other. So that was the first step that we had to do. We built a database that we called CANSAR, which brings together tens of billions of experimental and clinical measurements all in one place. And as you see from this diagram, these are genuinely linked. You can start with anything with a patient sample, 
um, or with a particular small molecule and navigate your way around this entire network. And in there we have over 25,000 anonymized cancer samples, patient samples. Um, we have over 3 million small molecule compounds that we use. We have the entire human proteome and we have a lot of data that we've deliberately selected to be disease agnostic so that we do not ever narrow our search field, that we do not make assumptions about what areas of biology will be important in cancer because any of them could be. Once we've implemented this integrated system and, and made sure it's future-proof and can grow, um, then we started developing a large suite of AI algorithms to sit on top of it and help us in our decision-making and drug discovery. So what does that look like? I'll give you one example of what those AI algorithms. This is um, cytochrome P450 number 17A, which happens to be the target of abiraterone. And in orange, that's abiraterone sitting nestled beautifully in that cavity within the protein. Now, what we discovered when we looked at all success stories, so thinking about the, the positive training sets, um, and, and our athletes looking across all positive success stories of, of drugs that work in humans, both in oncology and outside, we found that if you have the three-dimensional x-ray structure of the target, there are features like the existence of this beautifully shaped cavity that has just the right uh, size, just the right chemistry, just the right physics in order to make it work beautifully as a place to receive a drug. So what we did was we expanded this and developed this algorithm that takes every time we knew we find out the three-dimensional structure of a protein, once a week we update these analyses, identify all possible cavities on the protein, measure all of those properties that I told you about, feed them to our machine learning algorithm, and the algorithm will tell us how difficult it's likely to be to develop a nice small molecule orally bioavailable drug for this particular target. But this three-dimensional structures and, and proteins is not the only thing um, that we can use for information. In another analysis that we did and, and we published, we actually decided to ignore the fact that these are biological entities and molecular entities altogether and decided to focus our efforts on how they communicate with each other in the cell. This lovely dotted cloud is actually a map of the cellular interactome. All the possible connections between every single protein in the human cell. What you can't see, and you can see it as a green haze, is all the lines that connect every dot, which is a protein. This is a huge map, a really complex map, that is just a big interaction network. And what we did was we applied the same kinds of network analytics that you might see in social network analyses or computer network analyses. We applied it to the network of interactions between um, proteins in a particular cell. And what we found is that actually drug targets have very different patterns of communication to your average protein in the cell. So much so that we were able to develop very powerful predictive algorithms, their performance shown in the green line here, that can predict cancer drug targets. And uh, for those of you not familiar with these kinds of plots, um, if you were making a completely random prediction like tossing a coin, is it gonna make a good cancer drug target or not? It'll follow this diagonal line. If you were making a perfect prediction where you guessed correctly every time whether it's likely to, it's a good cancer drug target or not, it will be almost a perfect right angle. The green line is our prediction and you can see it's very close to that perfect right angle. Even just looking at the social behavior of these proteins in the cell allows you to develop algorithms that can learn from the examples you give it to make these predictions. Um, for drug targets. So how do we use this in, in reality? This was the first paper we published on this. We've done many since. We took a set of almost 500 cancer-causing genes that were well identified and well studied in the public domain. We did our analyses on them and identified that of them, 87 were already being explored uh, for drug discovery, 
But to our surprise, we found that 46, even though they're known cancer genes, were not being explored for drug discovery. And the reason they were not, even though they're very good and can really do deliver um, dr uh, drugs, so we call them druggable, the reason they were ignored was largely, in most cases, because people just could not identify them out of that soup. There was no reason to pick them out of the lot. And it was only when we applied our own algorithms to them that we were able to highlight them and pull them up. And I'm happy to, to report that at least 15 of these 46 are now in active drug discovery, um, not, not just by us, by uh, mostly actually by other uh, people all around the world. Um, so, one of the other things that we've discovered from this is even we, so successful as we are at ICR, could not possibly scratch the surface of what is possible in cancer drug discovery that can be identified through these really smart algorithms. And so what we've done all along is we always publish our methods and our papers, and we've made all of these data, all of these algorithms available through our cancer platform, which is accessed by cancer researchers all over the world, um, both in academia and industry, and, and we're proud to continue to make it freely, fully, freely available to the cancer translational research community. Um, and this was just this initial area of how we're using AI to inform drug discovery and development. Um, but the way I want to drive drug discovery in this way is that it really needs to be a very tight circle. We observe something in the clinic, we take it through the entire pipeline, powered by AI, all the way through back to the clinic, and we close the circle as fast as we possibly can. And I think AI is going to be a key component of this rapid translation that we're able to do. In the next part of, of my talk, I'm going to tell you about how we're now using AI to really think about the application in the clinic, not just in the discovery of drugs, but actually in the clinic. And the key problem in the clinic is that, of course, we are human and we are all different. And so while these big patterns that we say we want to learn can apply in, in general terms, when it comes to really identifying why a specific patient is not responding to a specific therapy, we really need to think very differently and very carefully in order to be able to help them. I'm going to tell you about an analysis that actually we've just submitted and we're very excited about, about the development of this ever-learning AI to help clinicians pick the best drugs for a specific patient at a specific time. And the example here is in lung cancer. And this work is in collaboration with my colleague Udai Banerjee in the Drug Development Unit at the ICR. So if you take lung cancer patients, you can do the initial thing, which everybody does. You do the profiling. Say you identified a set of patients that have a particular mutation. And this particular mutation is a great biomarker to start with a drug. What typically happens is this. Some patients will respond beautifully to the drug straight away and we're all very happy. Some patients inevitably simply will not respond for one reason or another. And then some patients, often a lot of patients, will respond initially and then their cancer will change, their cancer will evolve and will stop responding to this initial therapy. And the question is, how do we now use this information in order to distinguish why this patient didn't respond, which might be different to why this patient didn't respond, or this patient didn't respond? Once it's evolved, these cancers become very, very different things. And so in this analysis that we've done, we said, well, regardless of what the causes are, can we actually see some kind of patterns that we can use in order to change the therapy very, very quickly. And so we've come up with this plan where we can take the samples from the patients, straight away test them ex vivo in the lab, um, put them in, in flasks and then just put uh, a different drugs on each bit of the sample. Of course, once you've broken up the sample in so many ways, you're unable to really measure the 
proper response of the, that the patient is going to have to that. And the question is, could we actually measure something else? Could we measure the changes in the behavior of the cell um, and see whether that somehow can predict which of these drugs the patient is likely to respond to? So that's what we do for every patient. We split up the sample and we test a different drug on every sample. And then within an hour, and the speed of this is very important because of what I'm about to tell you later. Within an hour, we measure what are the phosphoproteomic changes in the cell, what are the molecular changes that are happening in the cell in response to that one drug. And then what we did was we trained an AI that can then take these changes and make a prediction as to which of these drugs is most likely to be efficacious. This is another one of those um, rock curves and just to say that in our best performance we're about 80% accurate in our prediction of which drug will actually work, um, at least based on, on the tests. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you about that in a minute before we come back to the patient. Well, if all we did was look at the genetics and which mutations were harbored by the patient, we get no different to, to random this dotted line. So that was really exciting to us. We validated this in the laboratory um, very strongly. And now we're actually um, changing the protocol of some of our um, clinical trials um, in order to test this algorithm alongside the decision that the clinician will be making to see how often does the algorithm agree with the clinician and how often does the algorithm make the correct prediction uh, moving forward. Um, so that's, that's a very exciting thing for us. But you will see that already we've now not only used the genetics and decided that the genetics alone is not enough, but actually we're now using these, um, sort of response phosphoproteomics in order to go and inform our therapy of the target, um, straight away. So it is really important to remember this point that a patient is not just their cancer DNA. We are humans and we are a complex interplay of many, many genes and many, many features and our family histories, our socioeconomic um, situation, um, our non-cancer medication that we're taking. There's a whole bunch of things about us that make us individual and make us different. And like I said, the cancer itself changes over time. The cancer that the patient started with at the beginning of their radiotherapy is very different to the residual cancer that's still there at the end of the radiotherapy. So we cannot just take a single snapshot and we have to think over time. Um, in order to address this, we've developed something called the Knowledge Hub and the Knowledge Hub is um, a sort of uh, a locker, uh, an under lock and key a research environment for clinical research that is able to integrate data from across all of the different clinical domain, imaging data, radiotherapy data, histopathology data, all of it for one patient, um, combine it together in one place to allow us to develop these AI algorithms. And I'll tell you just one quick story um, about how we're using this. This is in a study called the CHIP trial, which is a uh, large uh, longitudinal study of uh, curative radiotherapy in prostate cancer patients, um, where we're measuring late, um, late occurrence adverse events uh, that are debilitating and really life altering. And the study has been going on for a long time in the hope that we are able to predict um, these late uh, onset severe adverse ev events. Initially, lots of work was done to try and, and see whether the radiation dose that the patients are receiving is predictive, and that didn't work. They tried to look at various lab results, at clinician reports. They collected a lot of patient reported data. None of it was really working. They then started collecting information about the genetics of these patients, really deep molecular profiling of their genetics. And that too wasn't able to predict which patients were at risk of those um, long-term adverse um, radiotherapy um, events. 
And so we got together and we said, well, what happens? You can't use any one of them in order to combine these, in, in order to make these predictions. What happens if you combine all of these data in one? And so combine them we did. <clears throat> that together made 450 million uh, different measurements that we put together for about three and a half thousand patients. Like I say, using any one of them alone is not predictive, but what happens when you feed the artificial intelligence all of these data put together? This is a video displaying the patients and the clustering in blue are the patients without the adverse events in orange are the patients with the severe long-term adverse events. And you can see that through combining all of these data together, we are able to cluster and predict which are the orange patients who will develop these severe adverse events. And that was really, really exciting because for the first time we had a chance at being able to predict these patients. Once you know which patients are at risk, you can then have a conversation with them right from the beginning to discuss with them what are their options, what can you do with the treatment plan in order to minimize their risk. But also importantly, it means for the blue patients that we can identify now to be low risk, we can actually potentially increase um, the radiation dose and, and um, just ensure uh, therapeutic impact. So the key thing to find to know from this is as these cases become more complex, the signal becomes hidden. When you combine these different data, on the one hand, you're increasing the complexity of the thing that you're using, but that's really where AI comes to its own. It can see patterns that we can't see with our own naked eye, so to speak. So combining and following these data over time is absolutely key. And in fact, these findings and, and these successes that I've just been telling you about, we're now using um, in a, a really wonderful uh, national pediatric study where we are combining different data for kids that have had recurrent um, solid tumor cancers. And we're using the Knowledge Hub and these algorithms that we did in order to help the decision support for them to identify um, therapy avenues for them that otherwise we would not have known about. Um, and I really look forward to the outcome of this trial in, in due course. The last few moments I just wanted to discuss with you my own thoughts about the use of AI in healthcare. Something that I've been um, told a few times in conferences that's really interesting is this. I don't want to be treated by a robot. And my answer always is neither do I. The question is, do you want to be treated by your favorite doctor? Or do you want to be treated by your favorite doctor armed with all the knowledge that they can possibly have? And I'm sure all of us will pick the latter. It's really interesting um, as, a, as a technologist and, and also from my own sort of growing up in life. I love robots. I love computers. They were always a really fantastic, benign thing for me. Um, but in our culture, we really are incredibly distrustful. And the key things we're distrustful of um, are, you know, big data means sharing of uh, my personal data, which comes together with loss of freedom, loss of privacy, loss of my autonomy. So that's one really common fear that we all share. And by the way, we all should share. That is really important. But another one that I think is, is not so uh, justified is this mistrust that the computers somehow are going to take our autonomy away from us, that they are going to make decisions for us that are not necessarily in our best interest. And I do wonder how much of that is merely a cultural thing than, than based on any reality. And there's an awful lot of literature that I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with that really describes this, this dichotomy, this difference between the Western attitude to robotics and AI versus, say, the Japanese attitude to robotics and AI, where they, um, in Japan, they see that anything that one creates has the soul of the creator has a spirit of its own and is fundamentally benign or, or tending towards being benign. For us and for the use of big data and AI in, in healthcare, I thought it was important to dispel a couple of myths, um, in my opinion. 
Um, but before I dispel those myths, I thought it was worth thinking about what is the opportunity cost. Let's say we're locked down. Let's say we don't we don't do any of that. We don't use big data. We don't combine the data. We don't we don't do anything with our data. We just put it under lock and key and never use it, in order to make sure that you know we're not being threatened through those fears that we have. Well, here's the opportunity cost. So cancer cases are rising. <clears throat> more and more of us will be susceptible to cancer moving forward. But a really important thing is this. This is from data, all of it, data from Cancer Research UK, and this is the five-year survival for patients, for any cancer patient, but I think these are breast cancer patients. But the picture is very similar for most cancers. When you detect the cancer at early stage, stage one and stage two, versus late stage. If you detect it in the early stages, you've almost got a 100% um, five-year survival rate. If you wait until stage three, you are now around the 20%. That's how important it is to detect these cancers early. And we're not so brilliant at detecting cancers early. And so we really need to think about these early diagnoses and the development of an early warning system. We want something that doesn't wait until we've got the lump and we're feeling really bad. We want something that can just detect the smallest hints, smallest changes over time and alert the individual, the citizen, to go and seek help before it's too late. So how would we do that then? And if we didn't do this big AI, that's a potential opportunity cost. So it becomes a balancing act between our fears and, and our fears of privacy and, and data protection versus these sort of progress in, in curing cancer and identifying cancer. And this is where these myths that I want to dispel come in. The first one of them is this idea that in order to develop AI in healthcare, we must somehow compromise our privacy, uh, privacy and our autonomy. And Big Brother would be watching us. And I actually disagree with that statement completely. This is completely not true. In fact, they are in no way in conflict at all. I think they go hand in hand, and my own experience in dealing with patient data has shown me that very powerfully. Thinking about data governance and data security when we're designing any kind of AI analysis has helped us really understand and prepare the data in the best way possible in order for the algorithm to learn more. This understanding helps the development of the algorithm, not just the security of the data. And similarly, thinking about the use of AI and data can uncover security or governance vulnerabilities that can be fixed as you're getting these data together. You can say, aha, this should not be linked with that. I must make sure that it never is. So the two not only can coexist, but actually they feed each other, they cooperate with each other. Another thing to remember is that in order to do AI, for healthcare. You don't need to suck in all of these data and put them in one centralized place that is controlled by Big Brother. Not at all. We're developing fantastic technologies that allow the AI to be smart, secure, and go to the places where the data are sitting, learn from them, and then combine the learning rather than combining the data. And so I genuinely believe that those two go hand in hand rather than be in conflict. The next myth is that somehow um, we are, by using AI, we're surrendering our decision-making to the machine and somehow disempowering ourselves as humans and our doctors from making the right decisions for the patient. That's another myth that doesn't actually exist. And, and you see that because Often radiologists or doctors are crying for some of these tools to help them in their decision making. It will save them time, it will help them find things that they may miss and will reassure them of their judgment when they're making their judgment. This is actually a data set from that lung cancer 
work that I told you about where we would take the samples from the patients and test lots of drugs on ex vivo, feed it to the AI and make the prediction. In our work and in our algorithms, we always do this. So the yellow dots, the golden circles, are the data that we used in order to develop the algorithm. The blue diamonds are actually new patient data that we um, are now using the algorithms to make prediction on. And so as well as making the prediction, what we do is we say, actually, for those blue patients that are sitting in this cloud of golden blue, the algorithm is perfectly suitable for these patients. You can trust it, and doctors can use this algorithm to help inform their decision. While for other patients, you can see they lie far, far away from the core of the model and how it was constructed. So what we are able to say to the, to the physician is actually the algorithm is not suitable for these patients and the doctor should just use their own judgment alone without the use of the algorithm. And this means that when the data can help the physician in making their decision, they can and other times at the end of the day it is their decision and they're informed when the algorithm is not good. And that's how we make sure that the doctor continues to be in charge and continues to be empowered by these methodologies. So finally my vision for the future, I really think the future is going to be where healthcare is not a patriarchal thing, it's not a healthcare provider providing to the patient and the patient being a passive receiver of the healthcare. In order for us to beat cancer, this has to be a dual activity. We will have to empower citizens with the control of our own data and the involvement in our own health decisions and big data and AI on, on our little smartphones and apps can really help us do that, can help us detect those small patterns of change that are driving um, our cancers and causing them. On the other hand, we will empower the healthcare providers with AI augmented and supported decision making and these ever learning systems will inform them even on rare cases and help capture those. And finally, we must use our concerns over data privacy to shape the future of AI for our benefit. It is right to have that concern. We can use them to go hand in hand with each other and we must all be involved in shaping this future together. I will finish by thanking you all, um, thanking my team, my collaborators, my funders, and most importantly, um, our wonderful patients. And thank you. Hi, Melissa. Hi. Welcome to our last lecture discussion of this amazing Nobel conference. Before we get down to it, uh, just a reminder that following this discussion, all seven of our panelists, whom I can see on the screen right now, uh, will be joining us for one last live panel discussion. And so please do feel free to submit uh, questions still to Poll Everywhere. That's pollev.com forward slash Nobel 56. Uh, and we will um, mix those into the queue. You can also text them to 22333 um, and uh, type in Nobel 56. So uh, Melissa, uh, just would you like to share some initial reactions to that talk? I think it's so exciting. Um, so coming from my background um, in math and computer science and you know some with data science and machine learning, it's so exciting to see how these tools that I've seen applied in other ways can be applied to uh, cancer drug discovery. And I feel like I've learned so much and it's so exciting to get to share in uh, Dr. Ala Zakhani's um, enthusiasm, positive vision for the future. It's just energizing. Yes, and in the last segment, Scott Burr was emphasizing the importance of basic research and basic research in all kinds of fields. I mean, I think many of us understand, oh yes, computers are involved here somehow, but the scale and scope of what she's describing is, I mean, it's hard not to smile and I feel like we all right now want to feel optimistic about something and it's very hard not to feel her optimism about the capacities. Um, I wanted to ask you a question, and I'm not sure it specifically came up in this um, talk, but I know that it's something that we've heard Dr. Alazakani talk about elsewhere. Uh, she talks about cancer as a knowledge base, and I was unfamiliar with that term when I first heard her use it. I wonder if 
you can talk to us about what's a knowledge base, how is that different from a database, and then what's a data set? Yeah, so really it's kind of levels of sophistication and um, how that's set up to be able to interact with the data. So when we're talking about a data set, that's more the raw data. So you can kind of think about in, if you have an L sheet or um, some sort of spreadsheet, but you take away all the functionality you can do with that. The raw data would be the data set. Then when we're talking about a base, um, we can you know, ask questions about the data and be able to you know, filter the data in some way. So maybe look at records for only uh, patients within a certain age range or with a certain type of cancer, and so filter that way. Then when we're talking about a knowledge base, that's an additional level of sophistication and interaction that's possible there. It's also drawing from you know, multiple sources. So uh, when we're talking about cancer in particular, that's drawing from uh, data sources from lots of different places, lots of different disciplines, and creating this incredible combined tool that has so much power um, and can really give amazing information very easily and very accessibly to the public. I would definitely encourage the audience out there to go to Cansar and just search for something and see the information uh, that comes up there, even if you're not an expert on this. It's really impressive, the information that's available there. Um, and it's incre an incredible resource. And it just is amazing to me that um, this is publicly available. That's, that's so wonderful. Indeed, and that is something that she stressed in her talk is that this is a freely available uh, resource and, and that's, that's no small matter given the complexity of just keeping it up and running and uh, sort of searchable in a sense. Uh, can you talk a little bit more uh, about the complexity of, of the ways in which algorithms have to be written when you're talking about something like a knowledge base? I mean, I think she, she illustrated it quite beautifully when she showed that incredibly complicated picture of um, of a protein molecule and then um, sort of proteins um, a map of protein communications with each other can you drill down into that a little bit more because I, I think that's just fascinating yeah absolutely so um, we're looking at machine learning algorithms these are things that are kind of built to run um, on their own so that once you prepare the data which is no small um, get that data prepared and ready to go, the um, um, learns the data and can uh, discover patterns that um, we as humans um, aren't able to detect on our own. Um, and so this is why it um, is described as artificial intelligence, because this is um, actually learned. Um, there are different kinds of machine learning algorithms. Um, a, on a simple end, uh, which many students encounter in stats. Um, that's an example of a mini algorithm that is actually pretty powerful once lots of different um, input features, um, just having a linear model for something um, is useful. Um, on maybe other end of the spectrum, there are neural works, which are actually modeled after how the human brain works. So when we look at the brain, um, it's uh, all of these neurons connected to each other. And then the way a neuron works, it receives electrochemical signal. And then once it receives enough signal, it fires. And then its signal is sent on to other neurons, which may or may not fire. And all of this works together um, to produce everything that we do in our brains, um, all of our thoughts and feelings. Um, so when we're talking about artificial neural networks, they're actually really similar. So um, in the place of a, a biological neuron, we place it with the function. And so this functioning um, input from other neurons, and once the input is large enough, the produces an output that's then sent on to other artificial neurons. And so we get this kind of sequence of neurons uh, firing together, imitating how a human brain works. And then um, the way data comes into this is that data um, is fed through the uh, neural network. So you have the structure of a target that you're looking at and trying to classify it as, as druggable or, or not druggable. So through the algorithm and the neural network, and to the end, we can see if it's, you know, this is a labeled data, so we know if it's um, correct or not. So if it's druggable, great. Um, and if it's misidentified by the neural network, then that's where it learns. Um, so blame is passed backwards through the neural network, and it adjusts those functions and adjusts when they um, when they fire. Um, and so the uh, structure of this um, neural network and those parameters are changing so that the next time it sees um, a tar is a better job of uh, classifying it as druggable or notable. 
Um, so that's just one example of a machine learning algorithm. There are lots of different um, algorithms specialized for different purposes. Um, it's really cool stuff and really incredible what these things can do. Indeed, indeed. Uh, when she was talking about the capacity to, for clinicians to figure out whether a particular uh, uh, therapy would work or would produce side effects for a particular patient. That just feels, as she said, like an incredible tool for a doctor to have in their hand. Um, I wonder if we could turn uh, to invite the audience to participate in our poll. Uh, again, it, you can find it at pollev.com forward slash Nobel Conference. It looks like our audience has already begun to reply to the poll. Um, and again, just a reminder that uh, Poll Everywhere asks you to pick just one thing, and I'm sorry, I'm sure more than one of these answers uh, might fit your, your beliefs, but as these results come in, Melissa, what are you noticing? Does anything surprise you here, uh, given what we just That's heard Dalla Lazakani talk about? Yeah. So Oh, ooh, changing quickly. Um, so it seems like things have con kind of evened up here, but you know, the approach of like wanting to get as much data as possible um, versus um, misuse is possible, not a real threat to individuals. Um, so something that uh, Dr. L Lazakani uh, mentioned that I thought was really interesting was how um, thinking about applying machine learning algorithms um, um, to patient data can help us think about privacy. Um, so, like, in, you know, machine learning, they're really good at picking out patterns. And so what that means is that if you remove someone's name from their data, um, it can still be possible to identify who they are. So just because you take their name out, it's not necessarily anonymous. Once you get enough information about them, if you've got their zip code, their height, their weight, you quickly start to narrow down, you know, who they are. So um, it's really important to be careful about that kind of privacy and um, be a little bit hesitant about, uh, you know, what data is available. And I think that, you know, regulation is so there when we look at how companies are allowed to uh, use data um, and keep data. And it's really important that people have power over their own data. Um, mm -hmm. Indeed. This is a, an illustration also, I think, of small data. <laughs> that is, the numbers, uh, the percentages cha are changing very rapidly because, of course, our, our data set is not that enormous. And so each person's vote really does count a lot, although it does seem like it's, it's um, sticking close there. Uh, let's see. I had some other questions I wanted to ask you. Um, so what about, uh, so Dr. Alazakani talked about um, you know, I don't want to be treated by a doc, uh, by a robot. Um, do you uh, are you pretty sanguine about the fact that machine learning and artificial intelligence are going to always remain tools of a real life flesh blood uh, carbon based <laughs> doctor? Or uh, yeah, so, yeah, I think that certainly you know patients don't want to just be treated by robots, and that's important. But I think it's also important to think about like what's actually possible here. And Looking at where uh, machine learning is now, um, the most powerful uh, neural networks in the world, if we look at how many neurons they have, I think that's analogous to uh, the number of neurons of a worm or a bumblebee. So we're not, not approaching human here or anything like that. We're falling far short of that. But they're very doing really specialized tasks. Um, all all this information about it and trying to classify it as druggable or not druggable or looking at characteristics of a patient and trying to predict how um, if they will long-term side effects or no long-term side effects. So various tasks, um, but these machine learning algorithms or machine learning models are really good at try to, um, as they run into more trouble. It's important Term, they're discovering these patterns uh, from the, but they don't really understand what they're seeing. They have no context to being um, answer or um, developing a treatment for. All they know is that they see these numbers showing up a lot in this data set, and maybe that, that's important. Um, so I, I think that you know, uh, there's this difference between being able to see patterns and actually understanding things. So the analogy that I like to use is. You know, we have these huge, these powerful neural networks, and we've been training them for decades. 
and uh, in lots of different contexts. And uh, machine learning models aren't able to compete with that at this point. And I'm not sure the level of understanding that um, humans can achieve if that's ever really going to be possible for uh, machine learning models, but maybe that's more in your realm of what is understand is that going to be possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks so much, Melissa, for joining me, joining me for a little discussion of Dr. Al Lazakani's talk. And now, through the wonders of heroic productions and uh, indeed um, computer technology, we're going to shift uh, to bring all seven of our panelists together. Um, and we'll wait for Dwight to join us on. Um, I, oh, wait, I'm sorry. I think it's uh, Dr. Laura, Bur uh, Laura Burak will be will be our um, facilitator here. Uh, thank you to all of you who have joined us for these uh, two days and who have submitted questions and uh, who are, um, who have participated in this conference so far. Uh, we will have about an hour or so of discussion with all of our presenters here. And